G'day everyone, welcome back to Bears Banter. Today we are with a star of the New Zealand Rugby League, played for the Bears a couple of seasons in the mid 80s and we're going to have a good chat um, to him in a second. Just to remind you, these Bears Banter podcasts are brought to you by Stonemasons and Landscapers and obviously Norse who continue to support us through this time, so we appreciate that. Today's legend is a gentleman that I was able to play footy with as, at the start of my career. He came to the Bears club um, as a seasoned NRL player, a seasoned test player, um, brought much experience and knowledge to the club and to myself actually uh, at that point. Uh, his name is Olsen Filipina. Um, Olsen, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming along. Uh, you're welcome, Fly Spray, as I used to call you back in those days. Thanks for having me, Greg. You did, you did, and, and we'll start off with that because um, I remember distinctly we were playing down at, uh, I think it was Ronson Field then at Cronulla, and it was reserve grade, and you threw the pass, and I was through the hole, and I was off. And I heard from behind, go fly spray. And I thought, who's he talking to? And then I remember the huddle after the, 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 the try, and, he, and I said, Who, who's fly spray? And he said, that's you. I said, no, no, fly spray. He said, no, that's too hard. Yeah. Fly spray. Yeah, fly spray. Fly spray was. So I, it's a great term. I love it. No one else calls me fly spray, <laughs> so I thanks, love mate. it. But, mate, um, thanks for coming on. Let's just go a little bit through uh, who you are and what you're doing now. We're actually here today to talk a little bit about The Big O, which is your new book that's been published, um, available on thebigo.kiwi. Um, and that talks about your life and times um, as it, throughout your career and, and a bit about your family and, and, and everything. We want to talk a little bit about that if we can today. So if I take you back, um, a young fella from Mangere East um, coming over to the Balmain Club in 1980 for four yeah. seasons. Now, as a Polynesian coming over to the Big Smoke, um, I guess to you it wasn't a big deal, but to a lot of other people it was. And if you look back and think about the Polynesian influence in the game right now, did you realise the significance of what you were doing and, and the, in actual fact what was going to come behind you and did you think that there was some responsibility there or...? Yeah, no, it was just something that, um, you know, I didn't think would happen, uh, especially over here and, uh, you know, I wanted to come over even though I reluctantly you know, said no to myself and told everyone else, but my mother said, you've got to go and, you know, I was better off getting um, some money for what I do rather than in a crate of beer, yeah. which I was getting in New Zealand. So I decided to come over and, um, yeah, it was like, um, how should I put it? Like a country boy over here and never been to the city for about 10 Must years plus. Yeah. It was really tough. Something yeah. I've, you know, you, you had all... Uh, you know, nightclubs, everything open 24 hours, which was yeah. uh, nothing, un it was very unusual over in New Zealand. It yep. was a big jump for me. Yeah, yeah, so it must have been tough there. The, the, the club took you in, though. The, co the coach at the time, Dennis Tuddy, was a, a good mentor for you, and, and you, ex you were accepted in there. It was some tough times, though. I mean, from, from a racism point of view, yourself, it was quite a multicultural team, that, that Tigers team that you played in. You went yeah. through some tough periods, you know, from that perspective. I know there's a story where you got hit uh, on the head with a can of um, KB as you're walking off, off the ground. Yeah, that um, was up against, I was out at Cumberland over those days in Parramatta. And the racism and, you know, things like cans of beer that were getting thrown at me was, you know, I had no family, I had no, I had no support no whatsoever. Family. Yeah. So I more or less had to, you know, as a promise I made to my mother, I wouldn't get in a fight, get involved with anything or disgrace the family, you know, because mm. we were brought up mm. to um, respect their elders, no matter who they were. And so eventually I had to put up with the racism, cans of beer that was, you know, chucked at me. A lot of the players, you know, calling me names and everything else, hitting me 10 seconds after I passed the ball, little wax in the head, you know, little of those those things that still happen in the game today, mm, mm. you know, but I had to take it all and so I decided to do something about it and the um, only way I could do that was take the bloke's number, I had to hold 12 months, full season to get him. Yep, yep. And I ended up getting voted the hardest tackler and the hardest hitter yep. two years in a row and that was mainly because 
I couldn't cope, couldn't cop anymore. Yep. So I just took it out on a lot of the players, like I said, that yep. did things to me and they never did it again. Yep. When it comes to playing against Australia, a lot of them say I'm all less screw another extra leg. And that was mainly because, you know, I probably missed, didn't get about two or three players during the season or during my football career and I took it out on the Australians. You sure Best did. Matches. You sure did. I know, I know Wally Lewis um, <laughs> copped the brunt of a lot of, lot of, um, of you know, your, your play and, and, and he actually um, distanced you, is you a little bit in respect of, you know, how much you dominated him through that test period and, and, yeah. and people certainly respect, you know, how, at that level when you put on the black and white jersey, how well you seemed to go an extra leg. That was the theory, wasn't it? It was yeah, just well, amazing. Why, you know, I played 29 against, tests yeah. and, and, and every one of them, you were probably, the, if not the dominant, the top three players on the field. Yeah, I'd played against the best yeah, in Australia, you know, Brett Kenny and all them, and then I'd actually had to really test my skills against, you know, like you said, the great man Wally Lewis. It's funny, you, you know, you, how it sort of came around. I didn't know how to psych myself up. I got get motivated for it. The reporters were ringing me up. The phone was going hot. I had to take it off the hook because they were trying to ask me, you know, what are you going to do if I come up against the king? And, you know, I uh, watched State of Origin and uh, I always could never understand why New South Wales hated, hated this bloke so much. Because every time you watch the game on TV, all you heard was Wally the Wanker. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, crazy, it's a football game. Yeah, yeah. You know, but then watching him, what he could do and what he did to New South Wales, you know, when a lot of times on any games, New South Wales thought they had the game won, yep. he'd pull something out yep. just out of nowhere. Yeah. You know, and you guys end up losing the series. So I made it my goal to um, to meet him. I've become a fan of his. Yeah. And my opportunity came in the first test at Lang Park in 1985. So, you know, we, you know, we had, test was over, they got up, and we had a match function underneath the grandstand at Lang Park then. And my, I went straight, I seen him, I went straight, lined him up, went straight over to talk to him, yep. introduced myself. So. I put my hand out and I said, hey, Wally, look, I was a full of pine. He more or less hit it away. Yeah, yeah. Put my hand away and I'm yeah. going, what the if? Yeah, yeah. You know, and that was the motivation I needed. And so... Carved him up. Yeah. I said, mate, that's, I'm going to become your worst not me. And yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. You know, throughout the book, there's, there's lots of um, comments about um, your temperament and your unselfishness and your ability just to stay calm and, and get through, this, through the scenario. And I saw that as a young player and that's sort of, you know, what attracted me was your ability just to handle the situation. But, um, and I'd imagine what you'd been through coming into North Sydney was I couldn't really, you know, understand no. uh, at that point. But I know that, um, you know, you were a massive influence to me and I'll talk a bit more about that. But... So four years at Balmain, um, a season at Roosters um, in 85, and then over to 86 and 87. The time at Balmain, there was a change in coaches. Frank Stanton came Frank, right. uh, as coach. He was a different coach in terms of what you'd been prepared or you'd been used to, a bit more of a disciplinarian. He wanted you to be a marathon runner, not a, not a rugby league player. So it wasn't a great um, scenario at that time. How, how was your frame of mind going through that? being in and out of reserve grade, uh, being dropped for, for not wearing the polo to the game. Um. Yeah, it was like, uh, you know, um, Frank sort of wanted things done his way. And as you know, you know, being a Polynesian player, we like to play what's in front of us and on our instincts, and he didn't like that. And, mm. and uh, he basically said, well, you know, you're either going to play how I tell you to play or you know they drop to reserve grades so I only get to drop to reserve but didn't but you know it never bothered me because as long as I was playing rugby league. Mm. And then a few things uh, happened when he you know for example he um, had organised a knee splash specialist for me at North Sydney uh, there to go and see and uh, I went there to to see the knee specialist and walked in there and found out later on he was a psychiatrist. <laughs> oh what the, you know. Uh, that's a bit odd. One. Yeah, so yeah. You know, yeah. little things like, 
like that, don't yeah. look from So it wasn't a great away. relationship. No. And if you fast forward to 1987, where Chicka Moore was the coach when you originally That's came right. to North Sydney, North Sydney and then 87, Frank Stanton turns up <laughs> as North Sydney coach. How did you feel then? Well, I basically, well, I basically said, said to Frank, I said, look, I know what grade I'm going to play, so I'll be happy there. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I spent, as you know, I spent yeah. most of the time reserve grade. Yeah. You know, yeah. To me, it was all about playing league and entertaining the fans. And, yeah. you know, it didn't matter what grade I was playing yeah. as long as I was playing rugby league yeah. and making yeah. fans happy. Yeah, that's right. And you've entertained fans all over the world. You, tell, you say, though, your most favourite place to play and entertain the fans is New Zealand in Auckland. Carlow Park. Carlow Park. I had the pleasure of playing there as a young fella yeah. as well. What's different about that place? Well, it's like Leichhardt Oval. The crowds are right on, on the sideline, you know, yeah. and when you hear that chant, Kiwi, Kiwi, and then you get a lot of the fans yelling out, Olsen, you know, I haven't heard for all the time I was over in Australia. Yeah. Just makes you, turns you into a bigger and better player. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as a young fella, um, sorry, we'll just finish on the North Sydney part of it. What, what are your recollections of your time at the Bears? Let's take the, the coach and everything out of, out of it. It was towards the end of your career. Yeah, that's right. um, you, you're sort of facing that, you know, this might be the last chance for you to sort of kick on with your career if that was going to happen. You were still playing test footy for New Zealand. Um, you know, what was your recollection of your time at the Bears? But North Sydney Bears was one of the best times I've ever enjoyed rugby league over in Sydney. You know, because the then was that Mark Graham, Fred O'Croy right. and Clayton Friend. Yes, yes. You know, and then uh, the players themselves, you know, they, they really made me, uh, you know, feel at home. Mm. And how I felt with the three players I mentioned that played for New Zealand and, well, the Aussie players did exactly the same thing, you know, and I had a, a really great time there. And, uh, you know, I look forward to maybe one of these years before I pass away that North Sydney gets back into the comp. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, so he's hoping, mate. He's hoping. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's something I'll hang on hang on, and, you know, like I said, hopefully I'm still around for it. Well, I remember when you came to the club and um, we used to, because Florimo was next to Filipina, so we'd get together on the planes and, and those sorts yeah, on the sure. buses and I was just blessed to be able to sit next to you, although it was a little bit difficult on the planes because you have the fear of flying and I can remember seeing a man who was absolutely terrified holding on to his tiki bend over yeah, exactly and yeah, right. it's, it's, a real, it's a real issue for, for the flying, probably why he never got over to England to play. But, you know, we used to play squash together um, and, and I'd take as much as I can from you, particularly the lifts home on a late Thursday <laughs> night, even though I was around the corner, you'd say, come on, fly spray, get in the car and I wouldn't yeah. have to ride the skateboard home. So I appreciate really what you brought to the club and to me. But, um, if we go back, one of the questions, I guess, looking at this book that came out of it is why didn't Olsen Filipina become an All Black and a rugby union star? As such a talented young man who was playing in a rugby union system as well as rugby league. And as you say, the parents are empowered with these decisions for the Polynesian young people. And, um, and your father actually decided at, at one point that rugby league's going to be it yeah, and, and that's it. where you stayed. Do you have any regrets there? And have you had any, or did you have any um, thoughts of a career in rugby union at any stage? Yeah, that was always a thought of mine. That, you know, that's what a lot of the Kiwi kids over there dream about is playing for the All Blacks. It's, everything was about All Blacks back then and probably still is now, a lot more than league. Mm. And I made all the rep sides and secondary schools and all that and played beside a lot of All Blacks uh, back then and eventually they ended up playing for the top, you know, for All Black top side and everything else. Something I, I always have regretted not playing for the All Blacks because that's all I wanted to do when I left high school. Mm. But, and uh, you were a centre in rugby union? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I was a centre. Yeah, in outside rugby or rugby. inside centre? Inside centre. Inside centre, yeah. Inside, outside. Actually, when did you transition from, from centre to 5'8"? I mean, you came to grade as a centre for the Tigers. Yeah. Played outside, I think, Percy yep. Knight. Percy Knight. Um, and then you kept, went into 5'8 with him. Was that a natural transmission, uh, transition? Because what was, your, what was your position as a young fella? What were you playing? I played second row and prop. Second row and prop, okay. I made all New Zealand uh, schoolboy sides okay. as a second row and captain. 
uh, New Zealand side uh, under 15s and 16s as oh, a second row. And uh, just happened to be uh, Kurt Science and also had to be, you know, was in the same side as well. Yeah. So 5 8 only come, came around when Graham Lowe asked me to, if I wanted to play there. And it, it was like, uh, you know, like, like playing the trial game when you were a kid. Yeah. You know, when they say, oh, someone comes off, well, we need a halfback, we need a prop, or we yeah. need a winger. Yeah. And my hand would go up, yeah, I'll yeah. go there. Yeah. And everything else. So <laughs> Lowe said to me, well, I'm going to play your 5 8. And I said, I'm fine with that. Yeah. As yeah. long as I got to play the game. Yeah. And that's all I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. What do you think about the game now? How do you see it? I mean, it's a, it's a massive change. I, I, I remember this about you, because in the end, you, your elbows were, were, were that bad that you couldn't straighten the arm, and you had the ability to catch the ball under your arm and then pass it on, yeah, and you could do it right. both sides, because you couldn't virtually get that arm exactly. straight. Um, so uh, the game's come a long way, you know, in a lot of areas. Uh, what do you think of it uh, at the moment and how do you see the skill level? And Obviously, we talked about the Polynesian influence. Yeah, what did I say? There's 48% last year of, or 2018 of registered players were of Polynesian heritage. So. Yeah, it's great. I, I don't mind watching the game now. I think with the Polynesians, like I said, 48% at the moment. You know, I remember when I was a kid and you know, growing up and all that, how the old saying, I don't know, you, you might have heard it a few times, you know, they say a white man can't jump. You know, when yep. you look at them now, you know, yep. because of, I think because of the amount of Polynesians are pl um, that are playing the league game mm. at the moment in the NRL, you know, you're getting spectacular tries scored by them. Yep. You know, yep. and now you're also getting a lot of Australians doing exactly the same yes. thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think the fans love it too. Yeah. You know, it's a lot more entertaining. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, when you're getting these offloads, yep. you know, yep. that a lot of the players are getting away, but... Mm. You know, without the bent elbow that I had, <laughs> you know, so they're getting a lot of cleaner balls away. Yeah. And some of the passes and offloads you see yeah. in the games these days and the tries are just unbelievable. You yeah, know, it's spectacular. Yeah, yeah. And all that. You're enjoying it. Yeah, exactly. You're enjoying, I'm it. enjoying it. The bunker and all this other stuff. Well, you know, you're you're getting about three, four people looking at a video, and they still don't get it right. Yeah. You know, it gets a bit annoying. I just go change channel. Yeah. The, um, one of the changes in the game, and there's an interesting little byline to this, is the kicking, the goal kicking. And if, Olsen, if people don't know, Olsen had a very unique form of goal kicking. He was a reluctant goal kicker. He'd come in, he'd place the ball, toe stabbing style, take one, take two steps back, that's all he, all he needed, and bang, smashed it oh. through the post. And could do that from all over the park. So the goal kicking has evolved into the, um, around the corner. There's a note in the book that actually um, says that you were the very last toe poker in international <laughs> footy for the, to kick a goal for New Zealand. Um, but tell us the goal kicking story. Yeah, another thing. Why Graham it's such Lowe, a short? Well, you know, Graham Lowe involved again. He asked me if goal, you know, goal, goal kicker, and I said, I don't mind, I'll do it, but I'll let you know now. If it goes over, it goes over. If it misses, it misses. I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> and he said, that's fine. So, yeah. You know, that's why, that's why the two-step came in. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to muck around and, you know, I don't know what these goal kickers do. Have a, you know, you might as well have a smoke or a drink of beer <laughs> yeah. or something. I'll just, you know, I'll just put it down, line it up and just kick it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then actually a few times in test matches, uh, Mark Graham was a captain and, you know, he'd come up, you know, if, if you scored a try in your ear, because of my two-step, you'd go... Can you just take your time to stop so we can get a rest? I said, okay. So um, I'm going, what am I going to do here? So I put the ball down, I just walked around and looked like I was, you know, lined the ball up, goal up, and all this time I'm going, oh, maybe I should start kicking it now. And I went, oh, yes, it's long enough. So I kicked it, got it over, jogged back, Mark comes up to me, he says, what was that? Was it here in like 20, 30 seconds? There's not enough rest. Okay, I'll try my best on the next one. So, you know, because I just wanted to get, you know, put the ball down, kick yeah, it out, get out of there. Get on with yeah, the game, yeah, get out of here. You know, yeah. How was that? Yeah, awesome, awesome. I know, I mean, even from, because back in the day, you'd take kicks from 40, 50 metres out if you got a penalty. Yeah, yeah we'll go for the goal with a big heavy ball, and there's the big O, two yeah, steps out. Back then, like I said, it was with a bit of sand, the leather ball, yeah. boom, straight over. That's it. Yeah. I That's think the awesome. good part, because like I said, I didn't worry about where it went. Yeah, yeah. 
if it goes over, yeah. oh, well, okay, I'll get the point. If it doesn't, well, yeah. okay, move on. We'll go yeah. back and play football and score yeah. another one, see yeah. what happens. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, mate, what do you do with yourself now? I know you've always been an avid tennis, golf, whatever yeah. you can get your, your hand into. Yeah, exactly. You're still moving around, you're still active. Well, not sort of moving and I'm still active. Yeah. yeah. You know, the old saying is, yeah, you know, don't use it, you lose it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I still play tennis every now and again. Yeah. And everything else, but because of all the road ones we did back then, which I hated, my knees are no good, so... A little bit of tennis. Prefer the grass surface to you or the, the, the astro turf? What's the preferred surface? Oh, any surface. surface. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. bother me long. Okay. He's got a tennis now. Oh, right, time. right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, try and you know, spend a bit of time with my grandsons and grandkids. And, you know, as long as they play, you know, play a sport, I'm happy with whatever they decide to play. Yeah. Soccer, netball, as long as they're playing something. So, yeah, yeah I try and keep back as much as I can. Yeah. Well, mate, I know that the Bears fans really appreciated your efforts at the club and it's a significant signing for the club, an international of your level coming to the Bears and I know it had an impact on me, it had an impact on the fans um, and certainly all the players around you enjoyed you being there. As is, you know, said time and time again through the book, The Big O, um, which I encourage you to have a look at. It's an awesome story, mate. Thanks for coming in today. Appreciate your time. That's the Olsen Philippina story. Thanks again to stonemasons and landscapers. Thanks to Norse. Hope you've enjoyed the Bears banter. See you next time.